Welcome to the Bombshell Business Podcast, where driven women in business learn how to become more bold, brave, and unwaveringly confident. Feel empowered and challenged through inspiring stories and tell it like it is advice for business, life, and leadership. Welcome to the Bombshell Business Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Hurdle, and I just want you to know that I genuinely appreciate taking your limited time to tune in and spend this time with my guest and I. And and I just want to celebrate the fact that you are always on a mission to improve your personal life and your professional life. And I know that today you will get a lot out of this episode. Before we dig in, I do want you to check out today's show notes at amberhurdle.com forward slash podcasts with an S, podcast with an S, amberhurdle.com forward slash podcast with an S and select the Bombshell Business Podcast to get to those show notes. And then while you're there, of course, check out our upcoming Velvet Machete branding podcast where we are going to be focusing on personal employer and business brands. So I don't have many announcements today and I don't have any shout outs to give. So let's dive right into today's episode. I have been very eager to record this just based on my own professional experience and also being a keeper of secrets among the bombshell community. And I know this is really going to feed a lot of women um, and men, who, and my, my bombshell boys who are listening. So hold on to your seat because we have a serious bombshell on the show today. Now, despite her successful and demanding legal career, Andy Kramer has helped thousands of women navigate both the obvious and subtle gender biases they encounter in all career settings. Because mentorship opportunities for young executive and professional women are often limited, she co-founded the Women's Leadership and Mentoring Alliance to recruit senior women to mentor and support younger women on their way up. Andy is also the co-author of the popular book, Breaking Through Bias, Communication Techniques for Women to Succeed at Work. Partnering with her husband, attorney Al Harris, Andy is able to bring a unique, holistic perspective to the work of raising awareness of gender bias and what to do about it. Today, she's helping us understand the glass ceiling that does still exist and what we can do to keep moving forward while working together. Andy, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us on the Bombshell Business Podcast. Amber, thank you so much for having me today. If it's okay with you, I would love to just kick things off. I, there's there's a lot of connotations around words and assumptions and a lot of filters out there that help us determine what things mean. So can we just first define the term gender bias? So we're all using the same language and on the same page. Yeah, absolutely. All of us have biases that flow from stereotypes that we develop, some of them by the time we're three or four years old. And the stereotypes about women and men, leaders and family are the stereotypes that result in gender bias. And the stereotypes about women, women are expected to be, assumed to be, and punished if we're not nice and kind and sweet. And that's called communal, comes from the word community. And men are assumed to be and punished if they're not agentic, which comes from the word agency. And it means getting the job done, willing to take a stand, independent, unemotional. And so when we think about who do we have in mind to be the leader of an organization, who would we give the bet the company project to, very often gender bias would dictate that people would assume that a man would be better suited for that job than a woman without knowing what their personal characteristics are and without understanding who could actually do the better job. Which is interesting because in school, oftentimes it's the girl, it's the female who is asked to take on additional responsibility, who is asked to lead, who's the teacher's pet. And and so that shifts as we get older and we start stepping into these stereotypes that we've bought into? is Would that be a way of saying it? Well, th that's a fair characterization, although it's particularly interesting because in school, the way you set up the teacher's pet is she's assisting the teacher. Mm -hmm. She's being communal. She's not 
running the, you know, she's not running the newspaper or running the student council. She might be, but the expectations are that women do a lot more of the helpful work and the boys get to, you know, sort of be the boys and pave the way. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So you have a fantastic book that's out there and I recommend everybody check that out. Breaking through bias communication techniques for women to succeed at work. But you have another book coming out in August that PS is available for pre-order on Amazon. And that's called it's not you, it's the workplace, women's conflict at work and the bias that built it. So before we pick on the guys, <laughs> I want to really get real with us women. Can you explain why you wrote that book and a little a little secret hint of what it's about before we purchase that? Yeah, absolutely. It's basically an outgrowth of our first book, Breaking Through Bias. And when we started, my husband and I started speaking and writing about our first book, women would come up to us and say things like, I get along just fine with the guys. I hate working with the women or the women are nasty and the men are great to deal with. And I would start asking them questions. Why do you say that? And what, how do the women treat you differently from the way that the men do? And what came out of it was that because women and men hold the same stereotypes about women and men, a woman looking up at a woman who was in a leadership position would assume that she was nasty, not nice, not kind, not supportive because she had a position of power. Mm-hmm. That that's out of stereotype about what women are expected to be. And they would also want her to be like their mother or their sister and not their boss. And the senior women, because it's hard to get to a senior position, yes, there's still many, many more men in leadership roles than women in all of the professions and and most of the businesses in the United States. And want to get up there, you have to be willing to view yourself as something different from all of those girls that just don't seem to make it. Right. And so it forces a, a separation between the the older, young, um, more senior women look down to the more junior women thinking, well, I made it. She ought to be able to make it, too. And if she can't, then she's a loser. Yeah. And one thing that I love seeing in many of the organizations that I'm working with is the polar opposite of that. Yes, that I've I've seen it. Maybe it's because of the type of clientele that that I seem to attract, but they are reaching behind. They are reaching down. They are pulling up. They are saying, you know, here's the true Hollywood story of what it took to get me here. And I want you to have an easier path. And that's quite different from even just maybe five or six years ago. Have you noticed any shift in the right direction? Is, is the, is the discourse helping any? You've raised a very important point and I would spin it a little bit differently, which is that we found that women want to support other women and that women are the ones who mentor and nurture the careers of other women. Men don't generally go out of their way to help women the way that women go out of their way to help other women. Women want a workplace sisterhood and they strive for it. So what's the disconnect? The disconnect is between the expectations of the assumption that you're not going to be there for me because that's the, that's what all the popular press is about. There's book after book after book about, you know, stiletto in your back, um, (laughs) tripping the prom queen, mean girls grow up, meaner girls, meaner women. And so there's this whole genre out there, which basically says women are nasty and that we're either evolutionarily that way, socialized that way, or we buy into the misogyny that men are just better than women. In our research, my husband and I found that that's just not the case at all. That the reason is that workplaces tend to favor masculine norms and values, 
So those organizations tend to view as more valuable people who emulate those. And the sisterhood is alive and well in workplaces. It's just that women don't get credit for helping other women because there's so much pressure on them to be viewed and perceived and assumed that they're really only out for themselves. Huh. That's so fascinating. So one thing, and I find myself doing it too, Andy, I I do. And it's such a simple (laughs) little short word and, and I've gotten so much better about it. And I see this a lot in the bombshell community is that inability to say no. And I think this this is a huge thread in everything we've even talked about so far. And my challenge to women is often don't get the coffee, don't offer to take the notes, don't plan the frivolous stuff, focus on business outcomes. That is your, focus your contributions on business outcomes. And if somebody asks you to do something that is not going to allow you to, reach your business outcomes like a man would say no Don't do it right so let's well, talk about that dirty dirty uh, word okay well first of all when a man says no he's able to just go on no no sorry can't help you when a woman says no it's as if she thinks that somehow she's saying no forever and I'll give you an example. Um, a guy walks by another guy's office and says you available for lunch and he says no catch you later. You go by a woman. Can you have lunch today? Oh, no, I, I, I can't have lunch today. I really wish I could. I've <laughs> got to do this. I've got to do that. I, 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 you know, on and on and on. Well, you know, a simple no and let's do it when I'm available would work. And so we we try so hard to please other people because of the stereotypes and the expectations. We're not stupid. And we know that people want us to be communal. They want us to be nice and kind and sweet. And and so if we say no, then we're flying in the face of those expectations. And so on our website, we have with our blogs, we have some tip sheets. And one of the tip sheets is how to say no. And in our book, Breaking Through Bias, we take um, great lengths to try to help women figure out ways that they can comfortably say no without feeling like they've, you know, just committed uh, mass murder. (laughs) Can you give us an example? Sure. One of the things is that very often, because we want to please other people, we say yes when we know it has nothing to do to advance our career. And one of the things to do is say, well, I, I'll have to get back to you about it. Mm-hmm. Because if you give yourself, if you can separate the request from the, from the answer, it makes it a lot easier to say no. You have to, in that situation, you have to be very careful to make sure that you're not letting it go too long, that you've built up an expectation that you're going to do it. Because then the no would become even more, you know, negative, basically. Uh, but but distancing yourself from that, thinking about, is this something that would really benefit me and my career? And what happens is that because women are are very often more likely to say yes, whenever somebody asks for a project, I need this project done and it's a dirtball project and it has no advancement to a woman's career, the men are all looking at their belts. Uh They never look the person who's asking in the eye. The woman looks the person in the eye and all of a sudden they're like, okay, well, you'll do it. Mm. And so there's all these both verbal, nonverbal and ways in putting things in writing that can allow us to make certain that we're not taking on the office housework or going to get the coffee. The coffee example is a great one. I always tell women, sit as far as you can away from the door. Yeah. In a meeting that way, then you're not the one that they're going to ask to get the coffee or to get the photocopies or whatever. Yeah. And that's hard, too, when when you have like a natural 
caregiver uh, intuition or a natural hospitality intuition to not be that person. That that has to be a very decisive move that you're making to go against what your gut is telling you to do, or maybe not your gut, but your your natural inclination. Your training, yeah, your training, your your instincts. Yeah, yeah. Your now, for for example, I've walked into many a meeting where somebody has looked up and said. Uh, I'd like a cup of coffee. (laughs) And I, I believe that a key part in survival is to have a good sense of humor. I will always get the coffee or call somebody to get the coffee. And then when I start the meeting and these people realize that I'm in control of the meeting, you could see the color drain from their faces. Yeah. But I don't mind getting somebody a cup of coffee in those situations. But you don't want to be perceived as the pushover because in that case, then you always are going to be asked to do the things that don't advance your career. Yeah. And even having the conversation, I've had to do this before with bosses. When I was employed by someone else, I would be asked to do something and there would be a plethora of coordinators or admin assistants or whatever label, you know, is on that position in in various organizations. And I would be asked to do something. And so I would break down my total comp package and say, here's my salary. Here's what it costs you to to give me the remainder of my compensation. Here's my bonus. We're going to divide that. This is what you're paying me right now to go do that. Are you sure you want me to do that? Or do you want somebody making $15 an hour, $20 an hour to do that? I'm just checking, <laughs> just checking. But yeah. if as long as you do it with a smile on your face and you're not sort of wagging your finger in their face, Correct. that's a way to do it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's a little um, everybody has a different way. And I'm certainly um, lead with humor and sarcasm. often. Sure. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit more about overcoming discriminatory gender bias. You have several tips that you can share with women. Do you want to start kind of giving us a little checklist that we can go by? Well, I I would think that if we divide we divide it up to overcome gender bias, I put the world into two packet, two pieces. One piece is conversations that we have with ourselves, which is really all about what your bombshell business is about, being bold, brave, and competent, basically, which is conversations with ourselves about what we can do to feel confident, to feel like we have the competency. So that's the first kind of tips is conversations with ourselves. And part of our book, Breaking Through Bias, starts with conversations with yourself for those reasons. But then conversations with other people, here's where we have to keep in mind that people remember mostly nonverbal things. So that if we're meeting somebody, if we're face to face, we're in a meeting, we're with a group of people, the words we use are very often less important than how we say them. Sort of the, it's not what you said, it's how you said it, which my mother used to yell at me about when I was a kid. And I'm like, well, I did agree to wash the dishes. You know, why did you just slug me? Well, because it's the way you said it. Um, And so part of it is, is people get messages from things other than the words we use. But the other part of it is that we also need to think about how we use language. And because women are trained to try to be nice and kind and sweet and not too in your face. Very often women, when we know what the answer is, we will uh, sabotage our own position by saying things like, this may be a dumb idea, but. Oh, yes. Or uh, maybe I missed the point. Maybe I don't understand this. Maybe I got here too late. Maybe this is silly. Men don't do that. No. And women do. And why do we do it? Because we don't want to come across as too agentic. We don't want to come across as too masculine for fear that they will squash us. Hmm. Can we can we dig into that fear a little bit sure. more? Why do we feel that way? Well, part of it is by the time we're three or four years old, if we're a little boy and we say, let's go outside and play t-ball, he's a leader. 
if a girl says, let's go outside and play T-ball, well, she's bossy. You don't call a little boy bossy. You call a little girl bossy. Yeah. And so we're trained by society, by our families, by schools to be a good girl. Don't tear your tights. Don't get your dress dirty. Oh, boys will be boys. Mm -hmm. And so he's always going to have rips in his jeans. I can't keep up with it. That's right. That's right. And in school, interestingly, the educators are very big perpetrators of these problems because what will happen is a teacher said that there's studies on this where the teacher says to the class, I'm only going to call on students that raise their hands. If a boy shouts out the answer, the teacher will accept the answer most of the time. If a girl shouts out the answer, the teacher will stop, look at the stu- at the, woman, the, the little girl and say, I told you I only call on people who raise their hands. And the girl's sitting there thinking, well, she just, ca- ca- she just let Fred and Joe and John yell out the answers and she took it from them. Yeah. And so they inculcate these values in, 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 in children. Our daughter, when she was in fourth grade, came home from school and said, Mr. D hates the girls in math. <laughs> so we're like, well, honey, why do you say that? And she said, he never calls on the girls. He only calls on the boys. So my husband says, oh, well, and why do you think that? And so she huffs and puffs, goes, gets her backpack, brings it over, slams it down on the table, unzips it, pulls out her math workbook. And for the last month, she had written the name of every student who Mr. D called on in math and everyone was a boy. Wow. So we should have realized she's an MD now. We should have realized that she was going to so much for not knowing math. Right. Right. And uh, and, and science. But so it was parent teacher the, that night. And then she realized and she's like, oh, you can't tell Mr. D don't say a word. So, of course, oh, we won't say a word. We walk in and Al's shaking Mr. D's hand and he says to him, so, Charlie, how do you decide who you call on in math? And while they're still shaking hands, Charlie says to him, I only call on the boys. They are so disruptive. The only way I can keep control in my classroom is to call on the boys. And so, right. So Al says, well, that's really very interesting. Have you ever thought about how the girls might feel about it? And he looked at him and he said, you know, his eyes got wide and he says, absolutely not. I never thought about it before. Next morning, he's calling on girls. Kid comes home from school. I told you not to. Nah. <laughs> you know, we're like, Let, let's t- we'll tell you what we said. You know, we didn't you, you know, you weren't busted. <laughs> wow. But that's what happens. It's all, you know, he he was more concerned about keeping control of his classroom without realizing that the girls are thinking that he doesn't call on them because he doesn't like them and thinks they're stupid. Yeah. Well, and and so there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of assumptions on a lot of different levels. And, and I personally always advocate, that's what Velvet Machete is all about, is is being very direct, but wrapping the message in a way that is going to be well received by your audience or by the listener. Right. And so just another little plug there, Bumshells, that's an incredible story that it's, it wasn't his intention, but that was the outcome and the a direct conversation that wasn't threatening, that was certainly coming with a spirit of curiosity, rectified that. And, and that, exactly. can, that can be done every single day in our workplaces, every single day. It's just coming at things with a, a respect and an attitude of solving problems and not angst or blame. If, right. Not pointing fingers. Right. Makes right. a big difference. Absolutely. So we talked earlier about women who mentor and the sisterhood and men who mentor. And I have had more male mentors than than female. Part of that, again, is because there's more men in leadership, unfortunately. Right. So so there's that. But my relationships with my male mentors have been extraordinary. In fact, the bombshell businesswoman, the book, my, my foreword was written by one of my male mentors. So a dude, 
<laughs> and I'm from California originally, so uh, forgive my slang, but a dude wrote the forward to my book all about women because I felt like he was the right person for that particular job, if you will. Mm-hmm. But with the Me Too movement, which I'm completely in support of, there is a certain gender tension in the workplace right now. And even the the good men are scared. And so there's like an overreach of hands offness and of really trying to like keep boundaries. And that's not helping women any more than the other issues that we contend with. So can you, can you speak to that, uh, that dynamic and can a man still mentor a woman? It, a man, not only can a man still mentor a woman, a man, men must mentor women because the only way that women are going to succeed is if they're perceived as being competent and confident and bold and brave. And the only way that they're going to do that is if senior leadership sees them in those lights and believes that that's what they're all about. And without the senior men mentoring and supporting women, it's not going to happen. Now, you, you, you made a couple of important points there, which is that men of good, good, good intentions are still being concerned and frightened now with the Me Too movement. And a lot of them are saying, I'm not going to mentor a woman. And the response to that is that it's up to organizations to make sure that they have in place formal mentorship programs where men are expected to mentor women. It's not going to solve the problem, but it would make it easier if John is afraid to mentor Amber, that at least if everybody knows that he's been assigned to mentor Amber, then that goes a long way to allowing them to be seen together in talking about things. But it's also men of of not good intentions are using the Me Too movement as an excuse to continue the boys club. Yep. To continue to say, you know, if women thought that they, that the, you know, they thought there was a glass ceiling, but wait till they see the boy wall (laughs) because we're not going to do anything with them. And that's, that is so counterproductive and so dangerous to women's career advancement that we have to get creative in finding ways to encourage men that, you know, that that they need to be part of the solution. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I try to explain that when I get into conversations with men around this issue is is that for every awful story and I could write a book just on my personal experience of gender bias and sexual harassment for every bad experience. I have three really amazing experiences to speak of, too. But the problem is just so large that we we can't ignore it anymore. And, And I hope that men are starting to catch on the more that women are are finally being open about our experiences, that they will hear somebody that they deeply respect and that they know is not somebody who's just jumping on a bandwagon. When The more we talk out loud about the things that we experience, the, the, the more the good guys, if you will, are going to be there to, to fight right alongside us. So, Right, um, right, right. You know, one, one thing that you made me think of when you were talking about that is that there's a lot of studies which show that Uh, Most of the there is illegal harassment and sexual assault. And unfortunately, what we've learned in the last year plus is that there's a hell of a lot more than of it than we would have wanted to believe, which is really shocking. But the, the studies show that sexual harassment and sexually inappropriate behavior um, that doesn't rise to the level of legal harassment is not about sex. It's about power. Mm -hmm. It's all about power. And the studies show that organizations that allow and and don't stop gender bias are more likely to have sexually inappropriate conduct and actions on the part of their employees. And organizations that allow and don't stop incivility in the workplace are more likely to have sexual harassment and in inappropriate sexual conduct. Yeah. 
And so it's really a spectrum. It's a it's it's a spectrum where organizations, in order to deal with Me Too, has to be dealing with gender bias and with incivility. Yeah. So on that note, what what policies can be put in place in an organization to address the bias? Well, first of all, the bias needs to be removed from as many career advancing decisions as possible. You might be familiar with what our largest symphony orchestras did in the night starting in the 1970s, where they started to have people audition from behind screens so that the judges would not know whether it was a woman or a man who was playing an instrument, whether it was a white guy or a black guy. And or, um, our symphony orchestras went from 5% women to almost 50% women over the time period. And obviously in workplaces, it's not like we can evaluate people's performance behind a screen, but people don't get job interviews in the first place if they have ethnic sounding names or if their name is Jane instead of John. Mm -hmm. And so we need to get rid of, remove some of the discretion and the make decisions more objective. Another thing is if you evaluate people and there's a psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote a book that won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics. So the psychologist wins an economic Nobel Prize for his book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And this book is all about how if we think with our gut, if we react quickly, then we're going to rely on stereotypes and biases to make our decisions. And that we need to slow our thinking down. And that when we think slower and we evaluate people based on, you know, what are the core competencies? What does this job require instead of open-ended? Does this person have what it takes to succeed? Because very often those open-ended, does this person have what it takes to succeed, turns into personality contest or, uh, you know, she doesn't fit our culture because our culture is all male. Yeah. So she's really an outsider. You know, and that's so, and I don't talk about this a lot on this show because it's not necessarily on topic, but I'm, I'm a certified in the predictive index. And so what that does is it takes a job description and it creates a behavioral pattern. And then you can overlay applicant behavioral patterns on that and completely eliminate gender, name, everything, and just say, is this person behaviorally a fit for the for the type of behavior that this job requires? And so it can eliminate a lot of that bias. And absolutely, it's, it's such an amazing tool. And I'm so proud to have anything to do with this incredible company um, and to, to, to deliver that to my clients. And, and, and as you were talking, I'm just sitting here thinking like, yes, this is the answer. And so more technology and more opportunity like that is, is I, I just believe is such an answer to these challenges that we face in, in hiring and building great teams that are diverse and you don't have to say to people you've got to hire a diverse person if you give just if you look at what the 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 nfl the rooney rule where the all of the back um i guess they're called front office people you know the the managers and the coaches were all white guys in the nfl Mm -hmm. and rooney one of the owners of um the i think it was the um Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, he came up with the Rooney rule, which was that at least a third of the people who get the interview need to be people of color. They don't have to get the job, but you got to have a third of them. And miraculously, just getting that job interview gave these people, now there's a much more diverse coaches and back uh, front office people. Mm -hmm managers, you know, that kind of stuff. It's all about being transparent. It's all about being vulnerable. It's all about being strong. There's so many emotionally intelligent moves that we have to make in the workplace in order to get there. Is there anything, any final piece of 
advice that you want to leave with our bombshell listeners? Well, gender isn't the whole story because we come to work with all sorts of other social identities and whether we're black or white or or Asian or Latina or um, LGBTQ or you're young and I'm old or I'm old and I'm young and you're old or you're a mom with small children and I have an older child or I don't have any children. And we come to the office, come to the workplace with all of these other social identities. And our second book is all about how we can manage navigate and do better to have hard conversations with people who are not exactly like us. Yeah. And that's a big part of being sure that we can manage, navigate, overcome, or, you know, avoid the biases that, that we, we face in the workplace on a, on a regular basis from men and women. Yes, absolutely. It, cause it does go both ways. This, I always tease in the audiences that I speak to when they're female focused, or if, even if I'm being interviewed on TV or whatever, I just say, you know, I can't talk for the men, you know, I wasn't put on that team. I don't have, I'm not their spokesperson. I'm the spokesperson for this particular group. But as that person who really wants to put her neck out there for women and business, especially, it goes both ways. And we have our own biases that we have and our own things to overcome mentally. And if we could go full circle back to one of the first things you said, and that's the conversation we have with ourselves or self-talk, whatever you want to call it, and it's getting real with ourselves. So I, I like that final mm-hmm. thought there. Yeah. So Andy was great enough to set up a, a page just for you all. If you will go to andyandal.com forward slash bombshell, it's A-N-D-I-E and A-L. So A-N-D-I-E-A-N-D-A-L.com forward slash bombshell, Andy and L dot com forward slash bombshell. I know some of you are driving, so I'm trying to just get that in your head like a bad 80s commercial. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You can connect with Andy and, of course, see the many ways she can help you in these areas of opportunity. Certainly check out that book. And I encourage you, if you pre-order that book and I want you to take a picture of it and tag Andy and I both in the picture. Of course, you get all of her social media on her website and we'll have it in the show notes as well. Tag us both. Let me see you in action with that book and and we will see how much the world changes when we all come together to work on these important issues. And if you do pre-order um, that book, the It's Not You, It's the Workplace, or you buy Breaking Through Bias, I'd be happy to send you signed book plates that you could then stick in the books. Ah, so cool. Awesome. I know I have uh, lots of, of book bookworms in this group who um, genuinely appreciate that that special connection with the author. So, Andy, thank you so much for sharing your years of experience and your your education and your research that you and Al have done and, and taking the time to be with us today. Well, thank you so much, Amber. I've enjoyed talking with you. All right, bombshells. What another great episode. Again, you can go to amberhurdle.com forward slash podcast with an S to find all of the show notes. And of course, we will link to andyandal.com forward slash bombshell in that as well. I hope that you will take this, give us some serious consideration, see what you can do to stop the gender bias in the workplace. That is my challenge to you. Small steps in the right direction is how we're going to get there. And we will see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Bombshell Business Podcast. Visit AmberHurdle.com for more resources like show notes and check out the BombshellBusinessWoman.com to grab my book and download the free bonuses.